Ardra Shepard, and this is Tripping On Air, a place to talk shit about what it's like to have MS. Normally, I like to make everything about me, but MS also affects the people we love. So weighing in from the partner perspective is Alex Hajar, my friend whose wife also has MS. Join us monthly as we dish about everything from symptoms to stigma. If you have MS or you love someone who does, we want to connect with you. Ever wondered why your MS seems to be getting worse even though you're not having any relapses? Your MRI is stable, but you feel anything but? Maybe eight or nine years ago, I started to notice that after about 45 minutes on the treadmill, I'd suddenly start tripping. It didn't matter how hard I concentrated, I couldn't keep my toe from catching on the belt. I was on a highly effective medication, my MRI was stable. My legs were always strong when the doctor examined them. A six minute timed walk would have backed up the theory that I was doing well. I had no new or enhancing lesions, but I knew my MS was getting worse and I wasn't sure I was being taken seriously. As it turned out, my MS was getting worse. The time it took for me to start tripping on the treadmill went insidiously from 45 minutes to 30 to 20, and eventually my progression became obvious. In recent years, I started hearing more and more about smoldering MS. It seemed to describe what I was going through. My MS was worsening even though I wasn't having relapses. I felt relieved to have the words to describe what was happening to me, even if in my experience, smoldering MS sounds way sexier than it is. Our guest today is Dr. Jiwon Oh. She's the medical director at Toronto's Barlow MS Center. Dr. Oh is here to help us understand what exactly smoldering MS is and to give us the inside scoop on the scientific and treatment advancements we can expect to help manage progressive MS in 2024 and beyond. Dr. Oh, welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you here. What's the deal? What is smoldering MS and how does it compare to some of the more traditional ways we categorize MS? Thanks, Ardra and Alex, for having me. I'm really uh, delighted to be here. So smoldering MS, uh, Ardra, like you really nicely described, is something that I think people living with MS have, um, you know, kind of known about and have thought about and described um, for a long time. But there hasn't been as much focus on, um, you know, the clinical manifestations of smoldering MS um, in the past. Um, and it, it, it's for a few reasons. So first of all, um, from a clinical standpoint, um, we, you know, as neurologists, we use many tools in the clinic to try to um, measure how um, an individual patient's disability uh, level is. But um, let's be real, um, the tools that we use are far from perfect. And Ardra, I know, you know, when you're in clinic, um, you see us pull out the, the reflex hammer and the tuning fork, and all of the, these things have a role, and they're good for different reasons. And we even do uh, tests like the 25-foot timed walk, right, which are supposed to be a little bit more quantitative, but it's pretty clear that the tools that we use, um, while they're good for certain things, like, say, identifying that there are uh, neurological um, abnormalities in a person in a you know chronic disease like MS that lasts a decade uh, sorry decades if not a lifetime um, they're actually not able to very clearly detect disease worsening and so in these settings we're recognizing how imperfect the tools that we have are we're constantly searching for um, new MRI measures or new blood tests that may help us monitor this more accurately but don't yet have anything and so ultimately um, we need to be using additional say questionnaires or other clinical tests that will help us identify that people clearly are very slowly getting worsening, sorry, worsening, but um, our tools aren't detecting them. So, you know, from a clinical standpoint, exactly what you've described is what smoldering MS is. It's this slowly kind of grumbling, uh, progressive worsening of symptoms that are, you know, typical traditional tests cannot detect. And in the field, why there's such a focus on this is because smoldering MS is now um, rearing its ugly head more and more because in the last few years, we have access to what we think are highly effective treatments that can control relapses really well. But when we do that, 
what we're seeing now is people don't have relapses yet. They have these symptoms that are, you know, slowly worsening over time. I think that's something is was that a really big surprise to the medical community that these highly effective medications don't stop progression? It was in a way. And, and you know, this is an illustration of how as we make these amazing scientific advances, then additional cr questions crop up. Because, you know, even 10 years ago, the general thinking in the field was that the major driver of disability worsening in people with MS is what we think of as relapse biology. So these are the relapses that we see. These are the new MRI lesions that we can identify on clinical MRIs. So the thinking was that if we're able to get rid of relapse biology, most people with MS will be completely stable but that's not the case. And then all of these studies started emerging in the last five years showing that smoldering disease worsening happens even in the very earliest stages of MS because we used to think that this was only something that we saw um, in progressive disease and in later stages. So, so it was a surprise, Ardra, just because I think the field knew that smoldering MS was a thing, um, and it's really what we generally call progression in MS. I just don't think people recognize how early it happens and how common it is. And then when you talk to people with MS, there's these recent kind of huge surveys that have asked people in different countries, you know, thousands of people living with MS. And this is something that people with MS are like, yes, yes, this is something I see exactly like what you're saying. It's been super validating, like frustrating at the same time, but just validating to be like, yeah, you know, we're being taken seriously. Sorry. Sorry, Alex. No, nothing. I was just going to say uh, that sort of parlays really well into the question that I had actually, which is, is this, uh, is the understanding of smoldering MS something that's new? And it sounds like maybe the understanding is, but maybe the concept itself isn't, but are most neurologists on board with the concept or are some, some still coming around? Because I ask this because as a partner of somebody with MS, I worry that some patients may feel dismissed by their doctors and that there's a risk that they'll be further misunderstood or just not taken seriously by their partners or friends or family. Uh, and it seems like there's a lot of people saying that their MS is getting worse, but the doctor tells them they're just doing okay. So really great question, Alex. And I would say that um, the field is really recognizing now how important this is and from the very beginning of the disease. And so I would say in um, people who do a lot of research who, or who are at large kind of academic centers, you know, focusing exclusively on MS, this is a concept that most people are um, kind of embracing with open arms and really devoting resources to understanding. But because kind of the the traditional mentality is kind of so entrenched, um, it may not have percolated as much into the community as, as we would like. And so we're, we're starting to do that though, just because there's, um, and this is gets to the second part of what you asked me earlier, Ardra, um, there's many um, trials of investigational treatments right now that specifically um, have the potential to target aspects of smoldering MS. And so because of this, I think there's a lot of the message is getting out. Um, but, you know, say um, in somebody who takes care of, uh, you know, a number of people with MS and um, also takes care of people with stroke and Parkinson's disease and all of these other things, it may not be a concept that's as familiar only because, again, um, the field has in the last five years really been focusing on this and it's emerging as something that is extremely relevant and maybe even the greatest unmet need that we have um, clinically and um, scientifically. That's interesting. I mean, I guess with these newer therapies, maybe a question I could ask is, uh, you know, knowing that the drugs don't stop progression, can you clarify why patients need to stay on their meds? Because I find that some may say like, oh, I have an easier time without them. So, you know, I, I, I should emphasize that all of this is not to say that the relapse disease biology and controlling that is not important. I would say that that is um, essential in MS care as well. It's just that in the last uh, 25 years, there have been now, uh, you know, over 20 different treatments available, many of them that are really, really good at almost getting rid of all of relapse disease biology. So because we can do that, and, and this is to say that if, if we cannot control relapses, then absolutely 
people will accumulate disability and relentlessly. Like this is evidenced by all of the kind of longer term natural history studies that um, took place in the years before uh, treatments for MS were widely available. So if you look at some of the statistics in older studies, and obviously it's always difficult to compare, you know, older studies from 50 years ago to what's happening now. But um, when you look at these general kind of disability um, times that people reported at the time. So, you know, in some studies um, in people with MS at 10 years, um, almost everybody would require at least a cane to walk. And that's really different now. And that's because we have a ton of treatments that are really good at controlling relapse disease biology. But now that we're able to do that, what's emerging is um, smoldering disease that we're not that good at controlling um, at all, in fact. And um, that's why it's becoming so important. So people absolutely should stay on their treatments because controlling relapses is very, very important. And by relapses, I don't mean just clinical relapses because again, um, MRI disease activity helps us to detect relapse disease biology as well. But now that we're able to do that much better than we did 25 years ago, um, we now need to focus on this smoldering aspect of uh, disease pathology. And the other thing I wanted to emphasize is that one of the challenges we have is that MS is so variable, like in, a, in someone who's presenting at the age of 25, the way individuals disease course progresses is so different. And so in some people controlling that relapse disease biology, if you do it early enough, may actually help them to actually not even have smoldering disease. And that's kind of, that was the hope, um, you know, many years ago. Um, but in other people, they have more kind of uh, smoldering disease biology than relapse disease biology. So in these people, these are the individuals where we really hope to get treatments that can really target the smoldering component. Um, but And this is all to say that everybody has different kind of balances of how much relapse disease biology and smoldering disease biology they have. And so it makes sense that we treat with what we have available. So right Right now, it's excellent drugs for relapse disease biology, and hopefully in the next few years, we'll actually have drugs that can control the smoldering component, which is present in most people with MS, but not everybody. That's a really important clarification. Thank you for that. I want to go back to patient-reported outcomes in determining smoldering MS. You mentioned some of the tools that we currently use in clinic. I always think whenever that safety pin is opened and dragged across my flesh that, like, maybe I should have gone to med school. It doesn't seem that hard. Um, like we, I know that's like an oversimplification, but we don't have the tools maybe yet. But what is coming? Because... By the time my progression showed up on a 25 foot walk test or even a six minute timed walk, like I was noticing these changes years before then. So um, I guess the question is about how dependent on we are, how dependent are we on patient reported outcomes? And what are some of the tools that if we don't have them yet may be coming? What kinds of biomarkers? Like, how are we going to measure and investigate this? So, um, you know, in a nutshell, and I'll go into a bit more detail about this. Ultimately, I think it's going to be hard to find one measure that kind of captures everything. Because MS is so complicated and the neurological system is so complicated that it's unrealistic for us to think that there's going to be one magic blood test like you like um, they have in, say, diabetes, where you're measuring blood sugars. You know what I mean? And so it's a very different um, disease. And so the bottom line is, in the end, I think there's going to be probably a number of useful measures that we combine to try to better monitor um, uh, disease processes in people. Um, in terms of patient reported outcomes, um, I think there's they're very important. I don't think there's yet a clear consensus in the field as to which kind of scales are most important. But in general, I would say the symptoms that 
are much more useful um, to have reported by patients are things like fatigue, um, things like quality of life, um, even things like uh, bladder function and um, you know mood and all of these things are things that should be collected through patient reported outcome measures. Um, and right now, unfortunately, in the clinic setting, because we don't have a clear consensus as to which questionnaires are most useful, they're not routinely done. But I do envision in the future that this will likely become a part of clinical care. And it's not necessarily something that even needs to be done in the clinic. You know, if we have the right apps or, um, you know, kind of electronic survey systems, we might be able to have people actually fill these out before they, they come to their clinic visit. Um, I think also digital tools have a lot of potential. Like I think our lives are, you know, uh, you know, inextricably bound to our smartphones. And so in the end, I think there's going to be probably useful MS apps that we can use to help collect some of this information and even do like simple tests like manual dexterity tests, vision tests, um, even cognitive tests um, just on your smartphone. Again, there's no consensus about which app is most useful. But even at the Barlow, we're about to launch two studies where we're looking at some of these smartphone digital apps. So hopefully there will be ones that emerge as being very useful in the near future. And then I think um, imaging measures. So there's a few kind of MRI measures. One of them is uh, called paramagnetic rim lesions that are thought to be able to image smoldering uh, chronic active lesions um, in the brain. And so this is something that the field is looking at as potentially very interesting, you know, similar to the way that we currently use regular clinical MRIs and we look for new um, um, MRI lesions um, based on specific sequences that we have, maybe we'll be able to look for chronic active lesions in the future, which are thought to be a major driver of smoldering disease biology. And then there's different blood tests that look at different measures, um, including uh, neurofilament light chain um, and GFAP, amongst many others that um, people are evaluating to see if they're useful for monitoring uh, smoldering disease. So in the end, I think it's going to be a combination of measures. And so you might ask me what I do now. And so in the end, I think um, patients always know best because, um, you know, Ardra, you are the one that lives with MS every day, day in and day out. And when you tell me that you feel like your symptoms are getting worse, and you gave a few examples, like, you know, you used to be able to um, walk for longer periods without feeling like your toe was catching, things like that. I have patients tell me that, you know, they used to be able to walk from Union all the way to their um, workplace building without resting, but now they need to stop and sit on one of those benches in the underground path for an, a minute or two before they move on. So to me, that's very good evidence of disease worsening and you know every tool that I would use in the clinic would not be able to detect that I have patients tell me you know who used to be avid hikers they could they used to be able to hike for 10 kilometers without stopping and now they can only do five so these are all examples of um, you know patients reporting to me um, symptoms that I wouldn't be able to elicit in the clinic yet to me that is clear evidence of smoldering disease I think it's also true though for that for many of us there are worsening symptoms that we don't necessarily notice or attribute to MS. It's interesting to me how many comments I will see from somebody on the blog or the pod when I've talked about a specific symptom, and they will say, oh, I didn't even know that that was a symptom of MS. I thought it was aging or this or that. We're talking about how do we measure this? Is it even that important? If like we know it's there in, in different manifestations, obviously we have to treat different symptoms, but knowing it's there, like the next phase is what are we going to do about it? And so if you could talk about, you know, first maybe what scientific medical ad, ad, what we can look forward to or be hopeful about in terms of medical advancements and then about the lifestyle choices and and impacts that we can make to help mitigate some of the symptoms of smoldering MS. So, you know, I, I think it's important for us as you said, Ardra, that we identify that this is happening. And right now, because we don't have any clear treatments that can decrease smoldering MS, um, you know, it, it may not be as necessary to continue to monitor it. But the reason we keep searching for clear measures that allow us to monitor smoldering MS is because there's many experimental therapies being tested that the hope is that they will um, you know, 
decrease um, how smoldering MS is progressing or, um, you know, fix it or get rid of it altogether. And so that's why we need measures um, in clinical trials, but also eventually when there are treatments that um, you know, can decrease smoldering MS, we need to be able to monitor how effective they are. And so that's why it's, you know, number one right now, I think it's still important to identify that it's happening, but also because hopefully we'll have treatments and then we need to be able to monitor it so that we can, you know, tailor appropriate treatments uh, for people. So what do we have to look forward to? Well, first of all, you know, as we talked about, um, it's, you know, this is a real focus in the field right now. And so hopefully in the next number of years, we'll have treatments available that can, um, you know, decrease the rate of smoldering MS, maybe even get rid of it. And so um, there are certain um, experimental therapies right now that are being tested in clinical trials. Um, the closest ones to having phase three, so these are the large clinical trials reported, are um, a class of molecule called the BTK inhibitors. And BTK stands for Bruton's tyrosine kinase, and that's a, a certain type of enzyme um, in the body. And it's actually expressed um, in many parts of the body, but the reason um, we're so excited about this molecule in the field of MS and actually many other inflammatory diseases is because we know that it's a key molecule that's involved in um, B cell development, but also in the development of these cells called microglia, which are in the brain, and we know that are a major driver of smoldering MS disease processes. And so the bottom line is this is a class of molecule that maybe for the first time can, first of all, we know B cells play a major role in relapse disease biology. So um, early trials are showing that it very clearly helps to um, decrease relapse disease biology. But the, the interesting thing is these molecules also very easily get into the brain. And then at least in um, early kind of um, lab studies and animal studies, they not only get into the brain, but they actually decrease these activated pathologic microglia that we know are a major component of smoldering disease. So why are we so excited about this? Because maybe for the first time, this is a molecule that can actually decrease smoldering disease processes in people with MS. And so those trials are- yeah. I mean, this sounds super exciting. Like, when can I get some BTK inhibitors? So the first, progressive MS clinical trial um, of tolibrutinib, which is one of the BTK inhibitors, will be reported later this year. So really excited about it. I'm keeping my fingers and toes crossed because, um, you know, again, the early data look good. And this molecule, tolibrutinib specifically, is being studied in progressive MS. So both uh, non-relapsing secondary progressive MS as well as primary progressive MS. And there's many other BTK molecules being studied right now. It's, it's probably the only time in the MS uh, drug development um, time when, um, you know, over five of these are being actively studied in phase three molecules, uh, uh, clinical trials right now. Um, so exciting. Um, the only thing is the first BTK inhibitor, which was evobrutinib, um, this was a molecule that was studied exclusively in relapsing MS clinical trials. Everybody expected there to be a clear effect in these trials because um, uh, evobrutinib was studied versus teraflunamide. But we were all really disappointed in December to learn that those phase three clinical trials were negative, even though the phase two clinical trials very clearly showed an effect on relapse disease biology. So I'm, I'm you know, I sometimes worry a little bit when we put so much hope into something, but then I think having hope is so important. So I'm just keeping my fingers and toes crossed for the results of the tolibrutinib uh, clinical trials. It's being studied in both relapsing MS as well as two separate trials for progressive MS, and we'll actually have the results of both the relapsing MS and the secondary progressive MS clinical trials um, sometime in 2024. Well, so am I, to be honest. <laughs> fingers and yeah. toes um, I think yeah. I yeah. think when it comes to something like just the name smoldering MS, like it sounds like a campfire and smoldering campfire. I'm not an outdoorsy person, but that's just where my brain goes. Um, but it's sm a smoldering campfire can lead to a full blown forest fire, uh, according to some bears. So how much damage can a sm can smoldering MS actually do? Is it is it really just a slow burn or can it lead to relapses? So um, 
you know, I, I really like uh, the analogies that you're you're making, Alex. And I think the goal of using the term smoldering was actually related to that slow burn of a, of a campfire. So, you know, people think of relapse disease biology as the big flames. So the acute inflammation that can be very hot and aggressive and extremely destructive. And, um, you know, we, we actually, because we don't know it's very difficult for us to kind of evaluate MS, you know, at the point when it starts. Um, it's really difficult to know if relapse disease biology actually drives smoldering disease or vice versa, or whether it's both of them happening at the same time. And it probably is that, um, you know, it is still thought that the initial kind of start of MS is related to relapse disease biology, but very quickly that incites the smoldering disease and then it becomes kind of like um, this vicious cycle of events. So um, the, the smoldering component, as long as you are able to control the relapse disease biology component, you may not get the huge forest fires. However, that smoldering burn can be extremely destructive because it's confined kind of within the brain and the spinal cord. And it, it looks like, um, you know, with the relapse disease biology, when you're able to kind of quell the fire, that part goes away. It's just that this slow burn keeps going and can be um, really kind of destroy, be extremely destructive. Um, so yeah, so both of them are relevant. I feel like that leads to my, like, this is maybe the most important question I have personally, is does smoldering MS ever burn out and actually stabilize? Or does it just smolder until there's like, essentially nothing functionally left. It just maybe takes a different amount of time. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And again, an, I think an essential question that we don't have an answer to, um, just because, you know, I talked a lot about, we we're, we talk about smoldering MS as kind of this umbrella term that encompasses many different pathophysiologic processes. And one of them I talked about was chronic active lesions. And that's kind of where the term smoldering comes from, because in acute lesions that form related to relapse biology, we know that some of those lesions just become inactive after that acute uh, flame is put out. But some of them go on to become these smoldering lesions. And that's where they, there's this rim of activated microglia around the lesion. And there's this slow burn. So it slowly increases over time and causes more and more damage. So that's one component of smoldering disease biology. We think a dominant component that we can actually potentially image. But there's probably many, many, many other things that we don't yet quite understand. And then one of the complexities of this, Ardra, is that there's all of these effects of getting older as well related to smoldering disease, meaning that, you know, as people get older, we know that um, regardless of whether you have um, MS or not, people's brains shrink over time. And so there's all of these effects of aging that we think are probably compounded by additional effects of smoldering disease. And so um, in the end, you know, probably smoldering disease is not like this huge forest fire, you know, to go back to that analogy, Alex, that can suddenly ravage everything over time. But together, when you compound things with the effects of aging, likely, um, you know, neurodegenerative processes accelerate over time if the smoldering component is not kept in check. I say it all the time that MS has me aging in dog ears. I think it's literally true. Yeah, I mean, it's and, you know, these are all things that we're trying to understand more. There's now a huge focus in the field and, um, you know, managing MS in older people just because there was so much focus initially on, you know, as people are diagnosed and getting people on the right treatment. Yet, you know, it's clear that in any patient population, um, you know, it depends on who you talk to, what you mean by older, right? But um, we typically refer to as people get over the age of 50, things are very different than when they were in their 20s and you're trying to kind of start different treatments like side effects of medications are treatment. There are all of these different processes of aging in women which, who are the majority of people living with MS. Menopause is a huge part where, you know, there we don't quite understand how, you know, the processes of hormonal changes interact with the processes of inflammation related to MS. So there's really, really complicated. Still so much to learn. It sounds maybe like while we wait for treatments, a lot of the strategies to help mitigate smoldering MS are the same kind of strategies that you would employ to 
um, mitigate the facts of aging in general. Is that true? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I always say um, in clinic, um, while we're waiting for treatments to become available that can actually target smoldering MS, in the meantime, the best things you can do is maintain a healthy lifestyle. And so I say, in general, what's good for um, your general neurological health? So all of these things like, you know, sleeping well, eating well, a Mediterranean diet has been shown in many, many different disease states um, to be really healthy. Um, and not even in um, disease states, in just, you know, normal age. Um, it's such a kind of healthy target. And then, um, you know, keeping your mind and your body active. Um, and these are all the things that um, regardless of whether you have a chronic disease or not, it's amazing for me to see sometimes, you know, at the age of 60, the different trajectories that people's, um, you know, general health takes. And this is based on just like decades of habits, you know, and so, um, you know, all of these healthy living principles, regular exercise, having a great social network, keeping your mind active and interested, all of these things are essential for maintaining um, brain health, um, particularly as you get older. I love these tips, because these are things that are within our control while we wait for science to catch up. Yeah, these are absolutely these are so encouraging actually because i think like in our experience we try to use game I mean, apps right but they're uh, mind mind game sounds weird but puzzle games and things like that and try to go outside for walks and uh, i'm mediterranean by heritage so we eat a mediterranean diet and things like that so it sounds like just keep doing what you're doing i guess until there's actual more intense medical intervention for the, maybe not intense but you know uh, stuff that actually targets smoldering MS specifically. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's all stuff we can actually do at home, which is nice to hear. Absolutely. And it's not just good for um, MS. It's good for your heart. It's good for preventing Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all of these things. <laughs> Always so, remember, um, you can get more than one thing at a time. <laughs> That's not what I'm trying to say. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that when we have MS, we do tend to kind of blame everything on MS, but you do have to look after your whole body, right? Absolutely. And uh, there's a ton of literature on the effect of comorbidities on MS. So if you have uncontrolled high blood pressure and diabetes and cholesterol and smoking and all of these things, they actually make um, MS a lot worse. Um, and again, it's it's not just MS. They generally make your general health a lot worse. So um, these are all things to keep in mind. I just have maybe one quick question about do because I guess uh, people who live with MS have more susceptibility to infection. Um, and I'm just saying that because we've, we, Arjun and I have talked about being germaphobes uh, on, on the show. Um, does do comorbidities or, or just general infections like flus or anything like that play a bigger part if smoldering MS is more prominent in someone? So, um, you know, I think many people with MS because uh, uh, they are on immunosuppressant or immunomodulatory therapies. Um, that's why there's a slightly higher risk of infection. So I think always, especially during cold and flu season, um, good to be vigilant and, you know, use common sense. Um, we do know that when people have a systemic illness like a like the flu or COVID or a very bad cold, your body kind of revs up your immune system because it's trying to fight an infection. And so um, there, there's actually a term for this, we call it pseudo relapse, where people when they're very feverish, and your body is mounting this systemic immune response. And sometimes you can see this after a vaccine as well, just because your body kind of revs up the immune system. Um, people will often notice that, um, you know, neurological problems that they had in the past that may not be as apparent on, on a day to day basis, they'll suddenly notice that they worsen. So this is, we think, a component of of smoldering MS. So probably the more more smoldering MS people have um, in those settings, um, you can notice a lot more symptom worsening. And so that's why we do recommend a flu shot every year, just because when you get the flu, um, it's just not nice at all. And, um, you know, you're out for many days, and it actually really makes um, MS symptoms a lot worse. This is such great information, so much to unpack. MS is a constant learning curve for patients and anyone who has a stake 
in MS. Can you leave us, Dr. O, with something? I know we talked about BTK inhibitors, but what can we be really optimistic about in terms of MS care in 2024? What's coming soon and what's sort of maybe in the in the medium term that we haven't talked about? Um, so, you know, I think for the past decade, there's been a real focus in the field on progressive MS and progression in MS. And this all links to smoldering MS. And so I think there's a real effort. And I think in MS, we're lucky because the world really works together um, in the field to try to, um, you know, push the field forward. So really, there's been concerted effort, concerted efforts from um, MS societies around the world, um, major academic institutions, clinicians and scientists and patients all coming together to try to uh, solve this puzzle of smoldering MS and progression in MS. So, you know, not only are there therapies potentially that may become available, and again, really keeping my fingers and toes crossed, um, but we also, because we recognize this as a field, I think there's a lot of focus right now on trying to identify tools to monitor this better, um, trying to identify lifestyle modifications that can make things better. Um, and, you know, little things like trying to identify the right patient reported outcome measures that every clinic should be using. What are the cognitive measures that every clinic should be using? So all of these things. So I think um, the future is bright. You know, it always takes time for change to happen quickly. And, um, you know, hopefully there's additional therapies even outside of the BTK inhibitors that will be tested in the coming years that will make even more of a difference. But the bottom line is, I think the field as a whole, because there's such a recognition of the importance of this, will be moving forward in great strides in the years to come. So this has to do with not just therapies, but just general um, kind of clinical care um, monitoring um, principles about how to manage MS on a day to day basis. So I think overall, it's really good news. It sounds really great that the whole community is uh, embracing it, I guess, and 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 making a more prominent issue, and and so there will be a better understanding in the future, I guess. We all have the same goal. Yes. Yeah. Doctor O, thank you for sharing your expertise with us and for the important research and work you're doing at the Barlow MS Center here in Toronto. What gets measured gets managed. If you're concerned about smoldering MS, talk to your doctor. Treatments have come a long way, but those of us experiencing MS progression can feel frustrated that treatments haven't come far enough. Take comfort in knowing that the best minds in MS research are working hard to figure out how to stop disability from accruing, and that in the meantime, a number of lifestyle modifications can help slow the burn of smoldering MS. Exercise, sleep, good nutrition, strong social networks, and stopping smoking are actions we can take to encourage best possible outcomes. Thanks for tuning in, Trippers. May all your smoldering be limited to smoky eyes and suggestive looks. If you enjoyed this episode, like, comment, share. We'd love to hear about your experience with smoldering MS in the comments. Thanks for listening to Tripping On Air. Don't forget to visit us at trippingonair.com.